So as we said before, so these are the different imaging modalities that we will discuss, the different scanners that we discussed based on the different properties. And, and based on this is both our, each time we will look at what is the physical property that it, we are going to measure how can we measure this so what is the technology that we need to measure this and how can we translate these measurements in images which are then related to what we would like to look at eh? so as we said before morphology function blood flow this kind of thing now just to illustrate you the differences between these modalities and actually how they are complementary in some ways and how they capture uh, different information i well, each time, actually in, in almost each class, I will show you these slides. So these are actually images taken by the scanners from X, so regular X, and actually X with different boil times. Okay, so we here, uh, we have four X, one which is a raw egg, and then a hard boiled egg, and some in between. Now, what we want to do is say that these eggs are the bodies that we want to look at. So we want to diagnose or we want to look at what's the features. And one feature is what is the structure of an egg inside. Yeah? So as we know, there is like egg white, and then we have the yolk, we have like the airbag and things like that. So that is like the anatomy of the egg. But the other thing is also that we would like to know whether this egg is boiled or not. Yeah? So that's in a way tissue characterization in some way. So looking at what type of tissues we have. <clears throat> Obviously one way to look at the tissue and looking at the anatomy is destructive testing. Yeah? So if we destroy the egg, we will see that of course, we will know exactly what the uh, egg looks like inside and whether it's boiled or not. I show you also destructive testing because you have to keep in mind that um, our images or our imaging modalities are such that there are still patients where we cannot provide answers based on imaging. And so like explorative surgery, as they say, doing surgery in order to try to make a diagnosis, to try to see what's going on, is still something which is regularly done. So even that destructive testing, destructive imaging, really looking at uh, a patient is still being done. Fortunately, less and less, but at times it can still be necessary. Of course, what we want to do is do non-destructive testing, eh? because of course that is less invasive and can also be repeated, eh? because that's important when we do follow-up, for example. If you do therapy follow-up, then you need to be able to keep on looking at the same thing. And of course, we also want to do it as little invasive as possible, so with as little damage as possible, but we'll come back to that, to the safety issues. And here you see then different imaging modalities. And so these are these eggs imaged by projection X-ray, by computer tomography, by magnetic resonance imaging, and by ultrasound imaging. And you already see that these images, first of all, look very different, but also provide very different information. Okay? So one of the things that you will see is that when you look at it overall, what you see is the most crisp in brackets images with that show the most detail in some ways or the, the show the best temporal resolution in some ways is the x-ray image okay? and we will show projection x-ray is the modality that has the highest spatial resolution the problem is we can't see anything inside and the problem is we can't discriminate between the uh, different boiled eggs or not when we go to computer tomography, what you see there is that you can start to recognize structures inside. Eh? So you can start to recognize uh, the yolk, you can start to recognize uh, uh, the white, so the fact that there are different types. But as you can see with computer tomography, we are not able to distinguish between boiled and non-boiled. We can nicely see the shell around it. Eh? So that is very, very highlighted, so it's very, very bright but we cannot discriminate different tissues. And as I mentioned before, the reason for this is that um, X-ray based imaging, actually looking at the, is, is kind of imaging the atomic distribution, the atomic concentration, uh, the local concentrations and type of atoms that we're looking at. And of course, when you boil an egg, you're not changing the atomic concentration. What you're changing is, you're changing the proteins inside, so the, the, you're changing the, the molecules, uh, the shape of the molecules, so you're changing the distribution, the very local distribution uh, 
an interaction of atoms and not the atoms themselves. And that's exactly what we look at with magnetic resonance imaging. So there with, with uh, uh, MRI, we can nicely see which is the non-boiled or the boiled egg. And we will come back to that later on. That's actually based on measuring the water content or actually the, the, the kind of fluid uh, uh, contribution in some ways. So what you will see there is though, although MRI can nicely discriminate between the different tissues, for example, what you see is you don't see the shell with MRI or you can hardly see it because MRI is not able to visualize very hard tissues, very hard structures. And this is, for example, something that coming back to the, the, the question uh, uh, that was asked before. So if we take an MRI image, can we construct a CT image? Yes, partially based on the anatomy. But for example, we will never be able to nicely reconstruct the shell because we just can't acquire the information of the shell. So shell thickness, for example, we are not able to get that out of magnetic resonance because we cannot measure it. And also what you will see, and we come back to that later on, actually the, the spatial resolution of MRI uh, is not always great. It really depends on uh, sequences and especially time that we use for scanning. And then here we see an ultrasound image. Um, as you can see here in the ultrasound image, you can really see very, very different layers, very different structures. So you can very nicely discriminate the different things inside. The only thing is you only see one egg here. And the reason for this is that you actually can only image the hard boiled egg, or if you're kind of very, very careful, a peeled egg, because the problem is that ultrasound uh, waves, they cannot pass through the shell. So ultrasound waves cannot go through hard tissues. So we really need to, to, to uh, remove that. So there, for example, when we look at the heart, you will see that when we do imaging by putting a ultrasound transducer on the chest, what we need to make sure is that we go in between the ribs because we cannot go through the ribs when doing imaging. So that's a disadvantage. The advantage is that actually ultrasound, especially as we can see later on in the direction of the beam that we send out, so in the direction of the propagation of the ultrasounds, has a extremely high spatial resolution. The problem is the appearance can be kind of noisy. And as with before, you have problems with penetration through different types. So you see already that not only is the appearance of the images very different, but actually the information content and what you can extract from them is very, very different. It's because they're based on different properties and one imaging modalities will highlight one property more than the other. And so the choice of which modality you use will depend on the application, depend on the question that you have. Can I answer the question that I have with a certain modality with the right amount of confidence, uh, right amount of resolution, the right amount of the fact that we shouldn't miss any problems? So these are the things that you ask yourself when you're looking at which is the modality of choice. Okay, one thing that is also, which I partially uh, mentioned before also, is like actually sometimes we do imaging while we use substances for help. Okay? And so the typical things that we use is a contrast agent or a tracer, and that's actually a substance with very specific properties. Uh, these physical properties of this agent are relevant for the modality. Okay? So that means that a contrast agent by definition is specific for a modality. We use very different contrast agents for CT, for example, than for MRI or for nuclear medicine. And one of the things old is that a contrast agent has to be extreme in nature for certain imaging modality. Right? It means that when we use contrast agent, it has to really be highlighted uh, in the image uh, in order to be useful. But that will become clear uh, when we when we're talking about this. Mostly we use what we call exogenous uh, contrast agents. So mostly we will inject a contrast agent in a vein, for example, in order to do the imaging. Sometimes, in very rare cases, we can use uh, contrast within the body itself. We will, we will show later on that for magnetic resonance, there's a possibility to use, for example, hemoglobin, whether it's oxidized or non-oxidized, uh, that difference we can use in some ways as a 
tracer or contrast agent. But this will become clear. Most important is that contrast agents are very specific for a specific modality because of the fact that they have physical properties which are relevant for that modality. Okay, now when we go to, to uh, images, so one of the things of course is that we have to somehow kind of work with these images. Eh? And as we said before, processing is very important. Um, so we nowadays we actually work with digital images and actually many of the modalities actually provide by nature digital images. Eh? So both computer tomography, actually it's already in the name, it is computed tomography. So we need a computer in order to make the images and magnetic resonance imaging is by default, these are digital because they have to be reconstructed. Theoretically, um, ultrasound imaging or projection X-ray imaging can be done in an analog way. And it used to be like this, but nowadays also all of these things are, are of course purely digital. So what is important then is of course that we look at the sampling. Eh? So as we know, pixel size is, is important. Uh, and when you look, for example, at, at medical images, just to give you an order of magnitude, what you will see is that a projection X-ray would typically be, for example, um, 2K by 2K images. So that means that when you compare this, for example, to your camera, uh, your photo uh, camera in, in your phone, this is relatively little. Huh? And this is actually the highest resolution images that we have. So mostly medical images are relatively small in number of pixels. What you will see is that most MRIs, for example, is only 256 by 256 pixels. And we will come back. So when we talk about the physics, you will see that there's actually very specific reasons for this. And that very often physically we cannot go uh, um, at, to better resolution, which is both from a technological point of view so that we cannot make the technology in order to do it better, but very often even from the basic physical point of view. So for example, uh, when we look at magnetic resonance imaging, we cannot do it better because of technology and safety issues. For example, for nuclear medicine, we cannot get better because of the fact that the physics doesn't permit to have a higher resolution. So of course that the number of pixels is important. And also here again, the amount of pixels is not important, but it's the pixel content and whether they, they really mean something which is very important, of course. Eh? The other thing which of course is important is how many bits per pixels we are using. Yeah? So, so which is the quantization. And you see that depending on that, you of course see very different uh, information content. What we mostly have is like most imaging modalities are eight bit. But when we look, for example, at X-ray, we mostly work with 16 bit and there really is 16 bit of information. Now, this is another challenge is that we might have a bit of information, but keep in mind that most monitors, eh, when we display it on a monitor, monitors are not able to show gray values uh, with that kind of discrimination. So that means that we need software tools also to highlight different kind of parts of the image. And uh, this will become clearer later on also. Now, if we look at, at data sizes, um, one of the things that you'll see is that because of the, uh, relatively small amount of pixels, individual images are not that high, not, not that large. And so when we look at radiographs, you have, we have like about eight megabit, uh, megabytes per, per image. I mean, that's not a great amount. Eh? And, and with most investigation, you take like maybe two or three radiographs. So that's not that demanding. But the problem is that actually when we start to go to, to the uh, tomographic scanner, so the one that makes slices, what we there have that maybe an individual image might be relatively small, as CT is, for example, typically 512, as we said, 16 bit. But what you have is that we can take thousands of images. So it could be that we really take thousands of images, and sometimes we they take then acquisitions with or without contrast. So then it starts to become a bit more of an issue. And you have to imagine that, that uh, in, in hospitals, kind of tens of terabytes of image data is generated every year. 
So uh, it is a big challenge to actually manage this data, to store this data, to keep this data available, to transfer this data. And so that's why some of the computer systems in, in the hospitals are kind of quite advanced and why actually still also it's a challenge. Yeah? So if you will have the chance to directly work with clinicians, you will see that image transfer, image storage, image retrieval is still something which is not evident. It's not working as we would want it to work. But that's just because of the sheer amount of data that uh, goes in very large hospitals. And then also, of course, there's like legal obligations to keep that data for a certain amount of time. It's mostly that they are kept like at least 10 years and it depends on the country, it depends on, on the hospital, what is the policy to keep it. So that means that, that also thinking about which are the images that we acquire, uh, are they relevant? Do we need it? How many images do we do we acquire? For example, when we look, for example, at the heart, it's like you will see that with ultrasound, we will take many, many, many different types of sequences. But for example, do we take one heartbeat? Do we take three heartbeats? Do we take more? Do we take dynamic studies? Yes or no? So all these questions you have to ask yourself and always try to balance the clinical information, the clinical need with the technology and, and the potential for the logistics, of course. So then uh, when we talk about image quality, as we said before, there are different things which are important there. One is the resolution. So as we said before, resolution is partially determined by pixel size, but is much more determined by what we call the point spread function. Uh, what we will see is that actually most of our imaging modalities, they are not ideal. And what we see is that actually information is being blurred. So by definition, or it can be even the motion of the patient, eh? because mostly we take images of a patient while the patient is awake, but the patient is breathing, the heart is moving, the patient is moving, so this kind of things. That, for example, would already blur the images in some ways. <clears throat> but what we also see is that very often the physical principle or the detectors that we use, the sources that we use, they will actually make some blurring. Some of this blurring we know, we know the physics of it, and then we could try to revert it. Right? So we can kind of kind of sharpen the image if we know about what's the kind of physics or what's the mechanism that would blur the image. So sometimes that's possible, other times it's not possible. Right? So for example, motion of a patient, it's virtually impossible to uh, correct that in some ways. So here again, what is important is this what we say the full width at half maximum. So really, what is the when we talk about what is the smallest object we can see, then it's like, how do we see that object? And how is a small object being, for example, shown there? Um, one of the things, for example, that in some of these, these images is what we call partial volume effects. Huh? So what you see is there, if we have a dot so that means that we have, for example, say that we have a very small tumor that we want to look at. What happens is because this information can be spread over different pixels, what we see that actually also the intensity can go down. Okay? So you really see that, that uh, because of the size sometimes of an object, the appearance of an object can also be different. So these are things to, to keep in mind. Now, the other thing which is at least as important as the resolution is actually the contrast, is actually whether we see what we want to see. As I said before, when I show the X, do we see the difference between the shell, the white, and the yellow of the egg? Can we see this? And how big is this difference? Is this difference big enough in order to see it? Is there a difference between the liver, for example, and the kidney in appearance? <laughs> Is there a difference between the tumor that is available, that, that is present in a certain organ and the surrounding tissue? So that is based on the contrast and that's actually, that contains most of the information. The reason why MRI, for example, is considered as one of the better imaging modalities is be, be, because it provides a very good contrast between soft tissues. So we can see different types of soft tissues with an MRI scanner, which for example, we cannot do with a CT scanner. But on the other hand, what I said before is, for example, looking at bone is much better with a CT scanner. So again, depending on the application, we can have different contrasts and different modalities that depending on what we want to answer uh, might provide a uh, choice. 
Then of course, noise is something which is important. And again, noise is also important because there's different types of noises. Eh? So there's noise which is related, intrinsically related to the imaging modality. So where we need to understand the physics of the modality so we can sometimes improve it, yes or no. But then there's also noise because of the machinery that we're using. Yeah? Because actually most of these scanners are complex machines that uh, where a lot of noise is being generated by different components. And of course, they're also there only by improving the technology, we can kind of reduce the noise. So understanding where the noise comes from is important. And then of course, again, image quality is determined with what is this ratio between the noise and the information that I want to, which is very often expressed as, as kind of signal to noise ratio or contrast to noise ratio in, in imaging. And then, which is also another important factor is of course, artifacts. What you will see is that we very rarely get a perfect image in medical imaging. There's very often sources of artifacts, sources, creation of information which is not relevant or which is not relevant for the anatomy or the physiology. So, and this is, we need to recognize. Okay? Here you see in this CT image, you see that there, you see that you have these um, strikes, as we say. Eh? So you have these stripes uh, that's going there. And these are artifacts by the fact that actually this is a metal implant. So you see it's very, very white, even much brighter than the surrounding bone. And so this is bone, for example. So this is actually a hip replacement with a metal hip. And you see that the fact that this is there makes that surrounding this it becomes black and then we get these stripes. Normally black, just like here, in this part of the tissue, you see the black is actually gas in the bowel because it's air. Here, the black is actually an artifact. So this is very important to understand because of course, if there would be air surrounding the implant, that would be clinically very, very relevant. But as we said before, it could be that because of this metal, which is very high absorbing, and the uh, reconstruction or the image construction algorithms we use, it might be that causes artifacts. Or well, here, for example, is a magnetic resonance image. Uh, in this case, it's actually from an, from an animal. This is not a human. Uh, this is an experimental image. And what you see here is that this part of, of the body is much brighter than that part. That is not because this is different anatomically, but this is actually because, because of the measurement that we do, we get much more signal at this part than at that part. So that depends on the technology that we use. So these things, it's very important to be able to recognize it because when you interpret an image, you first of all have to ask yourself, what's the information content? Then is it an artifact or not? And if it's not an artifact, how does it relate to anatomy or physiology or function? So that is in a way the art in brackets of looking at medical images is like trying to recognize these things because that is very important to extract the information. Then as we said before, processing is very important. Eh? And here is an example of uh, processing in this case used for visualization in some way. It's like here is the original image that we have uh, just shown as is. But as you see, everything is in some ways Blurred. There's not a lot of contrast between the things that we want to see. And now, depending on the application, so if we want to look at the vasculature or the airways of the lungs, what we do is we use a filter where we see, in this case, you see the different airways. Or we use a filter where actually the bone is better. You see much more contrast in the bone. Or we can use a combination. And what you see here is an example of some kind of more advanced uh, image enhancements that can actually highlight both. Both make the bone as crisp. So you see, for example, here, when we look at this part of the bone and you compare it with there, here it looks like very homogeneous, but here you can actually see that within the bone, there is some kind of structure. Okay? So that's what we call like the trabecular bone, for example, or small cracks, you can actually see better here. And it's clear that the lung fields, you can much better interpret here the airways of the lungs compared to there. So besides the image quality 
intrinsically related to the uh, resolution through the contrast, the noise, and the artifacts. Again, the way that we present the images, the processing that we do, can help to improve in brackets the image quality in the sense that it can highlight better the features that we actually want to see. Here is another example where you see an X-ray projection of, of uh, a heel bone, where actually the idea of doing this type of, of imaging is trying to look at, for example, osteoporosis, where you see that that bone has been absorbed uh, by the body and thus can be like more brittle or fragile. And here again, by doing this, this type of analysis, uh, the type of processing, we can actually get more information. Okay, that said, um, now we start with really looking at different imaging modalities. So the first, as I said before, that we will discuss is radiography, uh, so which is projection X-ray imaging. So that is radiography. And so what we're actually using for these images is we use electromagnetic radiation. We use electromagnetic rays in the spectrum of the X-rays. Uh, so as we know, the electromagnetic spectrum has like depending on the wavelength has very different properties of different uses we know the visible light so there's a certain range of wavelengths that we can detect with our eyes um, then you have lower wavelengths which is going into the radio waves uh, that we can look at actually for magnetic resonance imaging we will see that we actually use radio waves we come back to that when we discuss it when we do X-ray or nuclear medicine, what we do is we actually go to the higher energy and lower, uh, smaller wavelength images, and we go up to uh, like like wavelengths in that spectrum. Ultraviolet is mostly not used for imaging so much, but as we said before, X-ray imaging is being used in projection X-ray and in CT images, and gamma rays are actually used in nuclear medicine. Okay, how do we make X-rays in, in, in practice? Well, there's two ways. One is the most common way, which is used in, in uh, current clinical scanners, actually. And that's actually based on X-ray tubes. So what we do is we have a vacuum to tube, right? so mostly a, vac a, a glass tube, which is vacuum. Then we have a cathode at one end, which is actually a glow wire. Right? So like the, the old traditional lamps. So we have a wire where we let a current go through. This wire heats up. And by heating up, actually, this wire starts to emit electrons. Right? And if we are in vacuum, these electrons really come free in the vacuum. And what we then do is we actually have like another metal anode in this case. And we actually put a high voltage. Uh, between this and this is really a voltage in the range of kilovolt huh? as we say it's like uh, between 50 and 125,000 volts uh, uh, we put there as as um, a voltage on there and if we do that actually because of the fact that electrons are negatively charged they are actually attracted by a positive pole so what happens is that electrons are being produced here by the glow wire they see this very high uh, uh, electrical field what happens is that they are actually attracted and they accelerate towards this and at the moment that they are like being that they are colliding on this anode so when they're really with high impact high velocity and that velocity is not stopped because it's vacuum eh? so these electrons can freely go there so when these electrons hit the anode what actually happens is that they lose their energy in the form of photons and actually in the photon form of x-ray photons so this setup actually produces x-rays which go uh, in that direction if we have like an angled uh, uh, anode so this way we can produce uh, X-rays where depending on the amount of electrons, of course, we have more X-rays that we produce. So the intensity of the X-ray beam is determined by the amount of electrons and that is determined by the current in this glow wire. And the energy of the electrons is actually determined at the velocity at which they impact on this anode. And that depends on the voltage between um, these two poles. <clears throat> so that means that we have 
the killer voltage and the ampere seconds, these are two parameters that every uh, X-ray scanner or even CT scanner has there, which determines the amount of X-rays and the energy of the X-rays that we will work. Now, this is the most common and the technologically more easy way of doing it. <clears throat> the only problem is that this creates a, what we can say is like dirty X-rays, yeah? because when you look at this, so the production of these electrons is random, it's statistically, so it's whether electrons leave this glow wire, yes or no. And then, of course, the way that they impact on this and the acceleration also is like this is totally not in phase. So while overall this produces indeed a bundle of X-rays, these X-rays are kind of not very determined in both energy and especially phase and exact amount. So now what they discovered uh, already quite a while ago is that there's actually a different way in order to uh, produce X-rays. And that's namely using what is called synchrotron radiation. And synchrotron radiation is actually based on the fact that if we have a bundle of electrons, eh, so we, have, we create a bundle of electrons, and if we use a magnetic field, which is actually bended, and this is an example of a bended magnet, what you will see is that because of the fact that electrons are negatively charged, they have to follow the streamlines of a magnetic field. So a magnetic field can be used in order to steer the direction of an electron beam. And so what you can do there is you can, uh, a typical synchrotron installation, what happens is that you produce electrons again with a glow wire, you then accelerate them, and then you put them in a ring of magnets. So where each time you bend the electron bundle a little bit so that in the end they keep on flowing at light speed approximately in a circular orbit. Now the thing is that each time that we bend an electron in a certain direction, what actually happens is that you can say like it kind of screeches in the band in the sense that it loses energy whenever you change its direction. And it loses energy actually in the form of photons, so in the form of light, and that's why uh, syn synchrotrons are also called light sources. And you see, for example, here in the middle, this is an image of ALBA, the Barcelona synchrotron, which is just behind uh, Colcerola in, in Sardaniola, between uh, in Sardaniola. So what you do is these are light sources because you produce these photons by bending these electrons. But actually, these photons are produced in the whole electromagnetic spectrum. So that means that we produce visible light with it, we produce infrared, we, we produce ultraviolet, and we produce x-rays with it also. And then the idea of this is that this acts as a source of x-rays, so that means that if we have a bundle of electrons going around in this circle, every time we use a magnet to bend them, what we'll see is that perpendicular then to the, or tangential, sorry, to the orbit of the electrons, we get a bundle of light coming out, which we then can use for um, exper experiments, for example, for imaging, for example, or other things. We'll come back to that later on, what you can use synchrotrons for uh, in the end. But in the end, this is a very powerful source of, of X-rays. Uh, here's an example. If you ever have the chance to visit ALBA on one of their open days, you really should do it. It's extremely interesting from the technological point of view. Eh? So here you see, for example, this is the accelerator uh, that's open. You see here are big, big concrete blocks which are normally on top of it because, of course, there's a lot of radiation going on in here. And you see these kind of both magnets to bend the bundle and as well as like, like cavities in order to accelerate the bundle to uh, compensate for the lost energy. And what you will see is that while synchrotrons provide very nice X-rays in some ways, very bright, 
um, but very good to do to do imaging, for example. Of course, you need this big installation. Huh? So as I said, in Spain, there is one, which is Alba. There's the, the, the other big countries in Europe also have one. And there's one which is a, a very large European one that's here called in Grenoble in France. That's like the biggest one. And then, of course, in the other uh, countries or the other continents, you also have uh, synchrotrons. But these stay large research infrastructures at this moment that needs to have like a, a kind of an orbit, a circle, like a building of, say, 100 meters in, in, in diameter. And of course, these these kind of uh, sources cost billions of, of, of euros in order to uh, use and operate. Huh? Now, the advantage is now that because of the experience that we have with this, what, what is being happening is that this type of sources can actually also be compacted in some ways. So in the future, we can actually uh, get uh, probably this type of light also in a more clinical setting. But currently, it's experimental. What is the advantage of, of synchrotron light as compared to uh, vacuum tube, uh, X-ray tubes? Well, the brightness is, of course, much higher. The energy spectrum is much wider eh, because we can also get an infrared and so we can get the whole spectrum and we can tune it very much. But what is, what is uh, very important is that these are kind of very clean X-rays. So we can really look at much more X-ray propagation properties as I will show you later. Okay, so once we generate X-rays, and let's now go back to using an X-ray tube, eh? because as I said before, in clinical practice, that's what we will mostly use. So what happens that depending on the setting of the voltage and the current through the glow wire, we get a different type of, or different statistics in some ways of the X-rays. Eh? And one of the things that you can see here, you see some different spectra, which are generated. So if we increase the voltage, what you will see is that the uh, wavelength decreases and thus the energy will increase. Eh? And so then depending also on the, on the uh, current that we have, we can change the, the intensity. Some of the other things is that you also see that sometimes we see peaks in this spectrum. I'll come back to that in a minute, why uh, that is relevant. But the most important is that actually we generate not one X-ray frequency, but actually a whole bunch, a certain distribution. And we choose that distribution depending on the settings of the machine and so on. Now, what is important, and that's actually what all imaging is, is, is based on, is actually how X-rays that we let propagate through the body interact with. Because the idea of, of X-ray imaging, whether it's projection X-ray imaging or whether it's a CT, is that we produce X-rays, we let them pass through the body, and we look at what comes out of the body. So we look at how the X-rays have interacted with the tissues, with the organs that they have traveled through. And in order to know how they change, we need to know what type of interactions there are. And there are three interactions which are very, very important and which actually determine what the images will look like. It's like one is what we call scattering. It's the Rayleigh scattering. And that is, is that if an X-ray photon passes by an atom, what can happen is that they interact in such a way that the photon will change direction. Okay? So it comes in at a certain angle and it leaves at another angle. That happens at low energies. So the lower the energy, the more of this type of things you have. You can already imagine that this is a sort of artifact. Eh? This is a source of artifact in the sense that what we want to know is when we let X-rays come through, we want to know exactly where these X-rays come from eh? because that will determine the tissue locally. So if then the X-ray has bended, then we don't know whether this X-ray was one that had no interaction or went straight or one that had interaction and is kind of bended from uh, an X-ray that came from a different uh, uh, direction. What you can already see is that this will reduce the spatial resolution eh? because we don't know exactly anymore from which direction it came. So that means that actually we have an uncertainty on the position, which gives you in some ways a kind of a blurring of the information. So this is an unwanted effect in general for uh, classical X-ray imaging. 
Then we have photoelectric absorption. And what happens here is that the energy of the X-ray of the photon is exactly enough to kick out an electron in the outer shell of the atom. Okay? So this is depending on the atom. So this is kind of quantum mechanically determined. Eh? So there is for each different atom, for each electron of every atom, there's exactly one energy that is exactly the right amount that if that photon is fully absorbed, the electron gets enough energy to escape from the atom. And this actually makes that we generate an electron, but the photon is totally disappearing. So that means that we have an X-ray that comes into the body but doesn't come out. And this is exactly what we want. Eh? So because we want to see how these photons interact with, with the atoms. Of course, the disadvantage is that now we create an electron and an ion. Eh? So the atom is ionized. So that's why this is called ionizing radiation. At the moment that the energy is high enough in order to be able to kick away electrons from atoms, then we talk about ionizing uh, radiation, which is partially bad because what happens is that actually what we create is we create chemically highly reactive atoms there, which can then damage tissue, which can then damage DNA, and which can then lead to cancer, for example. But we'll come back to that later on. But this is essential for the imaging because this is actually what we want is that we can, if we send in a certain amount of energy in the body, then a certain amount of atom will actually absorb this energy and will make sure that the photon doesn't come through anymore. Now, if we then go to higher energy, so once the, the uh, photon has energies which is higher than what is needed in order to kick away the electron, what happens is that it can kick away the electron and then actually propagates further as a photon with lower energy. Okay, that's for the high energies. And then, of course, very often in a different direction. So that means that actually the energy is changing that, that comes out of it, and the direction might be changing. That's what we call Compton scattering. So these are the things which are important and which are we actually using for the image. So, and as I said before, so at a certain amount of energy, it starts to become ionizing if the energy is enough uh, in order to, to kick away electrons. And this is what we start calling X-rays. Eh? So X-rays are the ones above the energy where electrons can be uh, created. So these are all the things that we use when we look at propagation of, of photons in the body. And so we have to think about scattering. We have to think about reflections, uh, which is mainly relevant for ultrasound waves, as we talk about, but of course, which also uh, work for electromagnetic waves. Just think about a mirror. A mirror is like a full reflection of visible light photons uh, um, by a certain surface. The other thing is the refraction, as we said. Eh? So because of the scattering, what we, we have is that the angle can change. Eh? And so depending on which are the atoms that the photons are encountering and what is the spatial distribution, we can see that actually this, this bending of, of the uh, X-rays will be different. We can actually use that for crystallography, but for most traditional imaging, this is not very useful. When we use synchrotron radiation, we will come back to that later on when we talk about CT, we can actually uh, utilize this in order to make better contrast images, but we'll talk about that later on. And the other thing is then obviously the absorption, which we want in some ways um, because that helps us with the imaging, but which of course can lead to ionization, sometimes uh, heat generation and things like that, which can become a problem, yes or no, depending on what we look at. So then how are we trying to use this? So as we said before, what we do is we have uh, the scanners which are X-ray projection, X-ray fluoroscopy, which is actually real-time projection uh, so that we can do real-time imaging. And then we have computer tomography. And they're all based on the fact that we generate X-rays. We let them pass through the body. They interact with atoms. Very important, as I said before, they interact with atoms. And depending on the type of atom that they, that they encounter, we will have a different interaction. Uh, we can have absorption or we can have changes of directions. And so that's what we're going to try to base this on. Now, of course, when we, when we the body, um, 
we never have one atom. Eh? So we have a whole bunch of atoms. And these atoms are actually very closely uh, related to each other. So what we actually do is we look more at like bulk in brackets content. And also, as we said before, our resolution, our spatial resolution of the imaging because of the technology is much, much worse, of course, than the size of an atom. We cannot see individual atoms uh, with imaging. So what we need to do is we need to look at statistics and so on. And so that means that we have a piece of tissue. And what we need to do is we need to know what is happening with the x-ray. So we have a certain x-ray intensity that get that will enter the body, will interact with the body, and a certain intensity will come out. And what we actually will see is that the intensity that comes out is related to, of course, the intensity that comes in, and then exponentially decays with the distance it travels to and the attenuation of the tissue. So the larger the body, for example, the less comes in. So that means that kind of Larger people need higher intensities in order to make imaging compared to very thin people. And then depending on which is the type of tissue that we see, so we have a different type of attenuation. So that's an exponential process. Now, the thing is, it's not, an ex not only just in general an exponential process. The thing is that this exponential process is actually only valid for a certain energy. So depending on the energy uh, um, that is being used, what we see is that attenuation can be different. Okay? So, and the other thing is also is that we have different layers. Eh? So what we will have is, first of all, we don't have homogeneous tissue in general. So that means that we have to make an integral of the position in to out, where we look at the different attenuation coefficients and the, dis the, the thicknesses of the same tissue that we pass through. So the out intensity will be the integral of over the body of the different uh, attenuation coefficients. And then, as I said before, these attenuation coefficients are actually energy dependent. So that means that actually we still also have to um, integrate over the energy spectrum. And then the intensity, as we said before, will depend on the, on the uh, energy that we have. And that, again, will depend on the voltages that we have. So in principle, this is like the formula, and we will uh, talk about this later on in CT, uh, how this is important. But the most important is that you have to keep in mind the amount of distance that we travel through, then the distribution of the attenuation in between, and then the type of atoms that determine the type of attenuation. That is important to see what comes through, yes or no. Now, one other thing which is also still important is that um, when we look at the attenuation, at the kind of dependency, the energy, so the wavelength dependency on the, on the attenuation, what we will see is that this is not smooth. This is not homogeneous. And what we will see is that, first of all, the higher the energy, the less attenuation. Okay? So because there's more interaction with lower energies, what we will see is that the lower energy, so, so soft X-rays, as we, as we can say, are attenuated and absorbed more than hard X-rays. That's one thing. But the other thing is also that at certain energies, what we see is that there's a sudden jump of attenuation. So what we will see is that here, for example, at this energy, attenuation is relatively low. And suddenly, when we go a little bit higher in energy, you see that there's a big jump in attenuation. And this is actually when the energy is exactly right to start kicking away an electron. So you will see here that if the energy is too low, we see that, OK, there is some ab absorption. But if the energy now becomes exactly quantum mechanically the right amount to start kicking away another type of electron, what we see is that suddenly, of course, a lot more of the x-rays are absorbed because they're actually absorbed by these electrons and fully absorbed by these electrons. And this is, for example, what we call this k edge. Um, Actually, this is something that we can use for imaging also. Eh? So this means that we can do in some way uh, kind of spectroscopy or fluoroscopy. So we can really try to target specific uh, uh, molecules. What you see here is this is actually lead in this case. Um, but all the different atoms have a very specific uh, kind of K-edge. And then we could try to look at the distribution, for example, of metals in the body in this way. 
This is currently not being used very much in clinical practice, but for example, with synchrotron and in research, we can actually do this type of thing. So it, it's then kind of what we say, X-ray fluoroscopy. What's also important is that, of course, this attenuation will depend very much on the atom, as we said before. Eh? So, so when we look at water, for example, what we will see is that water is virtually transparent for especially the higher energies. On the other hand, calcium is very highly attenuated. So that means that almost no X-rays will pass when they uh, look at calcium atoms. So that means that bone, where we of course have a very high concentration of calcium, will absorb a lot more X-rays than other tissues. And then when we use contrast agents, for example, eh, so like iodine, is the most typically used contrast agents for X-ray imaging. What we see is that, especially at a certain wavelength, we see that iodine absorbs a lot of the X-rays, and so it can be used as quite a good contrast agent uh, of X-ray. And so we see that these attenuation coefficients are very different for the different atoms, and this is actually what the whole imaging is based on. So what we try to do is we measure the attenuation of the tissue, and then we try to reconstruct or try to find out which are the atoms that actually cause this attenuation. And then we relate this atomic concentration to the type of tissue and then try to see the organs in that way, for example. OK, so as we said before, what we um, use now is use this X-ray, especially X-ray absorption effect in order to create images. And the first modality is the regular radiography. So what happens there is we have an X-ray source. It's, for example, here above the, the patient. Then we have a patient on the table, X-ray passed through. And then we have some kind of camera or capture device at the other. So I said before, this is the very typical appearance of these radiographs. Keep in mind that because of the fact that the X-ray will just travel through the body, what we will see is we get information on the attenuation of the whole part that has been passed through. So this is what we call projection. So you get information of the whole thickness in some ways of the body that it passed through. So with our example of the X, what you will see there is that although you see that there's a difference between the air and the egg itself, because of this, because everything is kind of put together, then we don't see the details inside in the structure anymore because we get a kind of um, accumulation of everything. So how do we detect these X-rays? Eh? So we said we produce it by X-ray tubes or in experimental settings or in the future with synchrotron radiation. But how do we detect it? Well, traditionally, we used a film, a screen that, that we would put that at the other side of the patient, which would absorb the X-rays that pass through and then would be transformed into an image. So just like a traditional film would be. Now, of course, the thing is to trap rays in some ways that's much more difficult than visible light. So the absorption of a traditional film is not very great. And now films are used less and less. So what we can have is instead of a regular film, we can have a scintillation plate. So that means that we have a plate with a certain substance, like phosphor or something like that, which actually would uh, capture the X-rays. But instead of capturing the X-rays, what it actually does is this is again a known interaction or an atom with a known interaction so that if an X-ray falls through it, it will interact with the screen and then produce another lower energy uh, photon. And this way we can actually convert X-rays into visible light. And visible light, of course, we have much more opportunities in order to see it. So. This is actually the, the, the traditional way, and this is when you look at, at the first development of, of X-rays uh, historically, where we had a high voltage generator, you had the X-ray tube that would produce the X-rays that would go through the body, and then a phosphor screen was being uh, used. That phosphor screen would convert the X-rays that would pass through into visible light, and then the radiologist could see this. Of course, this shows nicely the principle, but of course, as we know, this is highly dangerous because of the fact that 
here the x-rays are totally not concentrated and kind of are illuminating the whole body. We will see later on that we try to limit it to the field of view that we really want to look at. And of course, here also in this case, the operator is being exposed to x-rays. And that, of course, on the long term will almost for sure cause cancer in that person. Now, um, which is the other ways of doing it? So the other thing is that also, as, as I said before, we have two ways of looking at projection X-ray. One is making the photographs, that is the red, regular radiography, which means you take a one-shot picture. And the other thing is that we need some real-time imaging also. Eh? So if we want to look at dynamic phenomena, we want to look at blood flow, for example, or we want to use X-rays during surgery, what we need is we need to have X-ray cameras or so video cameras. And for this, actually, we uh, traditionally use what's called image intensifiers. And these are devices where the X-rays that have passed through the body, of course, eh, because we're talking about the detector, where we have a kind of phosphor in some ways that will uh, transfer the X-rays into electrons. And what we then do is we actually accelerate these electrons with high voltage fields and then have higher energy electrons falling on another uh, phosphor and then generate visible light in order to be captured with the camera. So this we can do if we have real-time imaging where of course we have much less x-rays coming in. So what we need to do is we need to kind of um, amplify the x-ray signal and this can be done by what's called the image intensifier. So these are the typical tubes that are used, uh, are still used a little bit, but nowadays they become more and more uh, replaced by digital cameras, as, as I will show you in a minute. So the advantage is that this can work real time because we can put just a regular video camera behind. <clears throat> but of course, what you will have is the resolution is worse because also this conversion into electrons that will again, uh, create artifacts or some distortions will create noise and things like that. But it's a way to be able to dynamically look at x-rays coming in. We use contrast agents with x-rays. And as we said before, it's actually iodine con contrast that, that we use. Um, again, if at some point you have the ability to go to a radiology department or work with a radiologist, it's always interesting to look at these things in reality. Yeah? So these contrast agents, as we will see, it's like when you look at this, when you feel it, this is a very sticky kind of fluid. So actually very uh, many of these contrast agents are actually in brackets nasty things that you really don't want to have in your body unless, of course, it's useful or it's the only way to look at something. Eh? So this is a thing that you have to keep in mind with all imaging is although we will talk when, when we talk about imaging safety or safety of the use of contrast agents or things like that, there's always this kind of cost benefit in some ways. It's like, what is the cost? What is the disadvantage of doing something? What is the danger of something? <clears throat> and what's the benefit that it gives us? What do we gain by using it? And actually, as we will see, there's not a single imaging modality which is non-invasive. Yeah? We know X-rays is ionizing, is dangerous in brackets, and people say that ultrasound or magnetic resonance are safe. But safe is, of course, in between quotes, because as soon as we do some things, it's not always safe, and we will see that there are some drawbacks with that also. Similarly to contrast agents, um, uh, a lot of these contrast agents, the biggest problem is that they are like, in some ways, a little bit toxic, uh, and especially what's called nephrotoxic, which means that they can potentially be a problem for the kidneys, because the kidneys are the ones that if we inject something into the body, and that is not being consumed in some ways, uh, no, not being converted into something else, it has to be kind of eliminated in the body. And the, the, the organ that does elimination of things in the body is the kidneys. And what we will see is that contrast agents, many of them can be potentially problematic for kidneys. And so especially patients with kidney diseases might have problems with eliminating this or with damage being done. And unfortunately, very often in this type of patients, it's actually more interesting to use contrast agents. So keep in mind, whenever we talk about contrast agents, they're useful because they improve the images for what we um, want to see. Keep in mind that there's always this potential disadvantage of 
the problems that we cause with it. Now, here is an example, uh, if I can get it to run, yeah, <clears throat> of uh, use of contrast agent in projection X-ray, so in fluoroscopy, actually, yeah, so in real time uh, imaging. So this is where a catheter, so a small kind of plastic tube, is actually inserted into an artery, in this case, the artery of the brain. And then we inject contrast agent while we do imaging. And as we said before, when you do X-ray imaging, <coughs> iodine will absorb a lot of X-rays. And so we really see the distribution of the iodine. So we really see it first when we, when we go here. So we inject it, then it starts to come into the arteries. Huh? So this is like actually the carotid artery. <coughs> It goes into the small arteries. And if we then wait, actually it turns into the veins. So here you see that it starts to get into the venous circulation and then actually drains out by the cerebral veins. And so this way we can actually look at the venous anatomy, but especially the, the uh, arterial anatomy. So we can really see if there would be a stenosis or an aneurysm or something like that. Uh, in order to do that. So this is the way that currently we look at vessels. This is actually still the way that we look at vessels, despite of the fact that with, for example, CT or MRI, we can see 3D images. As we said before, the resolution of projection X-ray imaging is actually the highest. So while we'll come back to that later on, while see, for example, with MRI, we can see objects of about one millimeter in size. So the, the resolution is roughly one millimeter. The resolution of CT is roughly half a millimeter. And um, with, with projection X-ray, we can go to a tenth of a millimeter or even smaller. So really looking at very small structures, very small vessels that we can do much better with uh, X-ray imaging. And that's why we still use it in order to look, for example, at vessels despite the fact that we and need to use x-rays and need to use contrast agents, but it's the only way to look at these very small structures. Okay. Um, yeah, so what we do use currently more is more and more digital uh, detectors. And so what we have is that instead of using phosphor screens, what we use we, is we use really chips. So it's mostly silicon-based chips where the x-rays actually interact with with the detector and then generate locally electrons which we then can capture it's a little bit like a ccd camera but then one which is um, kind of sensitive for x-rays advantages of course that this is digital this is smaller this is much more controllable the disadvantage is that the resolution is is lower the spatial resolution is lower because of the size of the detectors that we can make. It's improving the whole time, but still that is currently the limitation. But of course it's digital. So in a digital workflow, it works very, very well. And here's an example of digital mammography where we have and digital images, which then are immediately try to, to use it in some kind of image analysis, image processing that highlights potential lesions where then we can use, for example, machine learning to say which are benign or potentially suspicious uh, lesions, which then can be interpreted by the radiologist. And so we actually have like whole workstations in order to do that. Now, one thing which is also still relevant in, in imaging is when we interpret imaging, we actually also use uh, contextual information that we have. Eh? And so one of the things that we know in the body or the advantage that we have in the body is that many of the things are symmetrical. And so many parts of the body are symmetrical that we have two of or um, are symmetrical in itself. And for example, here when we look at breasts, we can really look at this symmetry. And by comparing the difference between the two symmetrical parts, we can actually extract some more information. So that is being used a lot in diagnosis is for all the organs or structures that we can use this kind of when we can use the body as its own control, it's much better because then, of course, things like artifacts or thickness of the tissue and things like that are kind of taken out of the equation. So what does a whole scanner look like then? So as we said, we have an X-ray tube. Then, because what we said is that the lower X-rays, the soft X-rays are the most dangerous, what we do is we filter out some of these. So the ones that 
all will be absorbed by all the tissue are of course useless. Right? So the low energies would always be absorbed. So they would always use ion, uh, cause ionization, will never come out. So they never provide any information. So we filter them out. Then the other thing, what we do is we use a collimator, uh, which is actually like LED screens so that we can actually focus or kind of take away the x-rays which are not being used for the imaging. So we can use, say like, okay, we want to look, for example, at the chest or at the abdomen or whatever, and make sure there's only x-rays going to the place where we want it to go. Then we have a collimator in order to uh, remove scattering. Uh, we'll come back to that in more detail with nuclear medicine, but the idea is that if an x-ray came through and its direction is being changed a lot uh, because of the, the um, scattering, what happens then if we put a collimator, then actually x-rays that fall under a large angle in this collimator are actually stopped. And so because we know the angle cannot be much more than the opening angle, so if they come in at a higher angle, then we know that they are artificial, uh, so or artifactual uh, uh, photons, and we can filter them out. And then, of course, we have the detector, which can be a digital detector, or which can be a film or a plate or something like that. And that's what we see then when we have a real scanner. We have all these different components there. Yeah, sorry, one question. Yes. Can you repeat the use of the scattering grid? Of the scattering grid? Yeah. Well, as I said before, it becomes a little bit more clear when we talk about nuclear medicine. Eh? But the thing is, like, if, for example, here, say that we would have a, a photon that comes in at a very high angle, what happens is that the, the thing is, the image here is not that great. But you see that these are lead, the black is lead plates with a certain thickness. And what happens is, so we have two lead plates with a gap with a thickness, which means that if a photon comes in under a very extreme angle, what actually happens is it actually bumps into this lead plate and is being absorbed by the lead and doesn't go to the film then further on. But as I say, it's not very clear here. When you look at the chapter of nuclear medicine, there it is, is um, explained in very high de detail because there it is really relevant for the imaging. Without a collimator for a SPECT scanner, we cannot make images. For a, an, an X-ray scanner, it's actually just to reduce the ones that come in at a very high, uh, uh, kind of steep angle, which we know can only be produced this angle by scattering. So by the fact that a photon came in under the normal angle that it, that it came in into the body, and then is being changed in angle, and so we know that these would cause artifacts and we try to get rid of them. But for a detailed technology, look at the chapter of nuclear medicine. Okay, thanks. Okay, so here are uh, some examples. And what you often have is that these X-ray tables are very versatile. So they often can be put in different directions. So a patient can be standing, can be lying on it. You can look at different different organs. You like have different uh, types of of uh, views that you can have. Uh, you might have a real time scanner at the same time as as a radiography scanner. So these are all different ways uh, that the equipment can actually be uh, used. As we talk about the uh, dynamic imaging, so where we really make dynamic real-time images. For example, as I said, with this injection of contrast in the brain to look at arteries. So these are always in angiography rooms. And so here we have the scanner where we have, in this case, at the bottom, we have the X-ray source. And then we have the detector, in this case, a digital detector. The patient is lying in between. And what you can actually do is you can rotate the whole scanner. So you rotate the X-ray tube and the detector in such a way that you can choose the angle. Yeah, because of course, because we talk about projection X-ray imaging, that means that sometimes, especially when we have these complex like vessels, what happens is that vessels are being kind of projected on top of each other. And if that's the vessel that we want to look at, what you do is you look from the other side, so where maybe you can kind of take them off of each other and you can discriminate. So these ways, we have something where a patient can be in, where doctors can manipulate it at the same time, because this is being used for therapy 
or when we have to inject uh, contrast, we need to do uh, catheterization. Right? So we put in a plastic catheter through which we will inject uh, material. We will, we will uh, discuss that later and when we talk about cardiac applications in more detail. And so we need a whole dynamic suit. And this is actually kind of like an operating theater because of course, when we start to put uh, needles and especially tubes into the body and certainly in arteries, we have to make sure that we work on the very sterile conditions. So lastly, a couple of examples. Um, so here you see, uh, this is actually one of the first X-ray images that were made. Huh? So that was done by Röntgen and, and uh, Marie Curie has also been working on this quite a lot. So here you see like the first time that they image the bones of a hand. And what you also see is that there is this structure here uh, which absorbed everything. And this is actually a metal ring. So that was a ring in this hand. And we know that the, the things that absorb X-rays a lot eh, are, for example, calcium is an atom that absorbs a lot of X-rays. And then all the metals actually also absorb the X-rays in the range that we look at a lot. So when we see, like here, for example, eh, when we look at this image, for example, eh, what you see is you see, first of all, the bones. Eh? So bones are much whiter in this case because of the fact that they contain a lot of calcium and so absorb more, more x-rays. Here within the bowels, you see these more like darker spots. This is actually gas within the colon and within the bowels that is there. And of course, gas does not absorb. Uh, then water, which is most of the soft tissue, are kind of mostly water, they absorb in between. And then the bone, because it has a high concentration of calcium, is absorbing even more. But what we see here is there is actually another structure here, which is even brighter than the bone. So it absorbs even more than calcium. And as we said before, that is then probably a metal. Eh? And so in this case, this was a patient that had swallowed a ring and you see here within the stomach where there's some air you actually also see that the ring was there and so by looking at this contrast between the materials so by looking at the properties you can actually find out what this type of material is here's a couple of other examples eh? so here you see uh, again a very bright structures which looks like scissors uh, which seems to be in the belly of of, of a person um, it's very bright, so it's, high, it's highly likely metal. So this is actually surgical equipment that was forgotten in brackets uh, during a surgery. Here's another example from a patient that had a metal arrow uh, shot through the head. And you see, like, was very lucky to survive, was actually straight in the middle of the brain so that it didn't uh, cut to true vital structures. One of the things that you see here also is like you see some kind of tubes coming out here. So this is often when a patient is during surgery or being like uh, has like a, a fluid line, for example, we can see that also. X-rays can also be used for um, looking at, at uh, for example, security. Yeah? So for security, of course, uh, well, there's a combination of there's microwave scanners and there's also some X-ray scanners. Most of the X-ray scanners are forbidden in use because, of course, it gives you ionizing radiation, but some countries can still use them. And so okay. here again, what you try to do is you detect metal objects as compared to other objects. Here is another example. In this case, you see something which is like duck shaped and it actually was a duck. This was a rubber duck uh, that was swallowed by a dog. Eh? Because also when you look at this and you compare it to the other images that we showed of chests, you see that has quite a strange shape. And so actually this is uh, an animal that swallowed by coincidence uh, this. You can find extreme things. Here's another example, a very extreme example. So this is what the image would look like uh, when the patient came in. So this is a patient that came in with uh, stomach problems, with like belly pain. And uh, so they had to diagnose what was going on. And so when you just look at this image, one of the things that you see is like, this is this large structure, which is very bright, even brighter than uh, the surrounding bones. So then you know that this is likely metal. Uh, 
and when they did surgery, this was a, a patient that had psychiatric problems and that was actually eating cutlery. And so that was, of course, stuck in the, in the bowel. Sometimes people are experimenting with things. And so here you see it's a glass bowl that was uh, stuck after doing some experiments that uh, kind of some laser experiments that went wrong or not completely as they uh, wanted. Here are similar examples. So when you ask radiologists, like which are the strange things that they can see coming in. So people can come in with all types of objects which have been entered in different types of, of uh, orifices of the, of the body. But by looking at the properties of the images on x-rays, we can extract information that we want. Eh? So here, for example, you clearly see that this is an object which contains of different tissues, eh? because with x-ray, we try to do tissue characterization. So there are things here, which is some metal structures, which is likely batteries connected with some kind of bright, probably metal wires to another metal structure that will be a motor and that the hole is captured in something which is very tissue-like. So probably some silicon or some plastic, which has like a similar water content as muscle, for example. So what I expect you to know or to try to reason about is, okay, why is something a certain appearance on the image? And does that relate to what's the structure? Right? So here, similarly, you can see an electricity wire or I think this was an image taken in a prison where somebody had tried to hide a weapon uh, in some orifices. Now, as we said before, you can look at structures, but you can also look at more detailed structures. And here's an example of looking at bone. So here you see this is bone, which is clearly less dense or more disorganized than this one. So this is looking at an example of osteoporosis, for example. Some other things is that you can do functional imaging in some ways. Huh? So you can see, for example, in uh, certain clothing objects is how are the bones changing with, with regard to each other. And this, for example, is very important for people that do biomechanics huh? and want to try to calculate the forces on uh, different bones or different structures. And you see, for example, that in this case, when you use this type of shoes, you see that the force on the bone is in a total different direction than it uh, used to be. So sometimes this can lead clearly to some problems. So uh, lastly, as we said before, you can use contrast agents. You can inject them in the veins, but you can also inject them through other orifices. So this is an example of where somebody drinks a contrast agent in order to look at the structure of the bowels. Huh? So this is to detect, for example, Crohn disease or other abnormalities. Or it can also be that the contrast is being injected from the from the backside. And uh, so here again is still oral, uh, where you see you can look at the appendix, for example, or look at small details. And this is like an enema where you see a little tube here where the contrast is sent from the other side. But all of this is to highlight, to create contrast between tissues that you normally cannot see, cannot differentiate. Eh? So as we said, X-rays can look at bone, but cannot look at different soft tissues. So in order to see soft tissues, what we do is we add the contrast agent, which actually highlight the structure, the inner structure, the luminal structure, as we said, of tubes, for example. And these are very, very typical examples. OK, so last um, but not least, just an example also, again, that I want you to think about some of these things. Huh? So, uh, for example, this is, this is an example of an artist that makes x-rays of very, very large objects or make, make x-rays for, of like, for example, a scene where people are available. So when I show you something like this, you have to think about these things, huh? because of course, if you say like we take an X-ray of an, of an airplane, there is no way we can make an X-ray source and an X-ray detector with the size of an airplane. So what we need to do there is think about like, okay, how can we do this? And actually this guy, what he did is he patched this up. So with a regular scanner and then by taking patches or so by moving the scanner the whole time and then later on digitally reconstructing these images, that's the way that he did. And for example, when you take this scene, uh, 
Yeah? So where you see a whole bunch of people in a bus, again, of course, one thing is the patching thing, but the other thing is, of course, there is no way that an artist can make X-ray images at this resolution of so many people. I mean, when you think about it, we said before, X-ray imaging is ionizing radiation. It's potentially dangerous. This shouldn't be done. But what the guy did actually here is he took a skeleton, right? because at X-ray it's mainly the bone we see. He took a skeleton uh, uh, that he just put in these different positions, and it's actually one skeleton, and then again composed images. So you really, when you see this type of images, especially on social media, you have to think about, okay, how are these constructed? Is this something which is real or which are the ways that this can be constructed? And that's why I want to end with this image. And again, this is from an artist. This is a, a, a Belgian artist that made these images. And when you look at these images and you, when you start to think about, there's something weird about this. Eh? So I don't know whether you see it, what is weird, but what you see is like, okay, you see bone, which is white. That is what we know. Bone is white. You see the nose, which is like dark eh? because the nose is soft tissue. But what you see is that actually the tongues of these people are also white. So the question is, is that possible? Well, physically it's not possible eh? because soft tissue does not absorb x-rays. So this is an image which if we would use a regular approach, for imaging, this image cannot be because there's contradictions. What we know is soft tissue is actually being highlighted in this image. So actually the way that this guy did this is by actually using a contrast agent. Right? So what he actually did is he took the tongues of these people, he painted it with a contrast agent, and then because of this, you can actually see the structure. Yeah? So this type of things is like when you see images, you have to see is like, okay, we know how X-ray works. We know what are the tissues that we encounter. It's like, can this be possible? Can we see this? It's artifactual. And this is the way that we have to interpret it. So this clearly is, if it would be, if you would say to me, this is a normal scan of a normal X-ray, then I would know that this is a clear artifact. So that means that these tongues have to be like calcified or something like that. But that obviously doesn't happen. Eh? So that's why it's very important when you look at these images to always be able to think, okay, what do I see? Why do I see it? What's the underlying reason that it appears like this on the image? And that's actually what you have to learn in this. And that's why I want to end with this video um, that shows you an object that you probably know. Um, this looks like an, like a typical Italian espresso maker. Eh? So, uh, and it's actually a dynamic process. So this is indeed an espresso maker, which is on a uh, fireplace. And so coffee is being made. And you can nicely see now that uh, how this coffee is actually going through the system, going through the filter, through the coffee, and then actually fills the coffee machine. So now I ask you to again, think about this. It's like, is this possible? Is this true or is this fake? When you think about it, we know these espresso makers, they are metal eh? because otherwise they would melt, of course. And what we also know is that water is normally transparent. So normally metal should kind of attenuate all the X-rays and water should let it pass. So here is actually the opposite. So again, if I would show you this image, then you have to tell me that this is actually totally impossible that this is an X-ray image. There's no way that what we know about the context, namely that this is a metal coffee maker, that this is an X-ray image. And actually what it is, is this is not an X-ray image, but this is a neutron image. So what happens is that instead of X-rays for imaging, we use neutrons from a, a nuclear reactor for imaging. And neutrons can pass through metal, but doesn't pass through water. Right? So again, something that appears like being an X-ray image might not be. And so these are the things that I think are quite important that you would understand.